down. And I want you to go to the book of Genesis. And uh, today, let's go to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16. And the text will come from this. We'll show a few other verses on the screen and, and uh, go to a, maybe a couple verses. But today, we're going to be in Genesis 16. I, I want to bring a message to you today that will finish up this series on uh, what's your problem. Can you say that with me? Ask your neighbor, what's your problem? Yeah, you guys have really been enjoying that for the last few weeks, I can tell. And some of you have said it with some attitude, too. Some of you have done your head like that. You know, what's your problem? And uh, you guys, can we say it with a little, little something behind it? Like, you know, just, what's your problem? Say it like that. <laughs> See, yeah, I knew you guys had it in you. I knew you had it. It was there all along. I knew you could do it. And uh, Brother Theo, you don't have anybody to ask that. And uh, to, and uh, but it's good to see you, man, and uh, appreciate you being here. And uh, you can ask Miss uh, Miss Allen there. Ask her what's your problem, right there beside you. There you go. <laughs> Look, she asked him back, "What's your problem?" <laughs> ask me. I'll ask you. Man, aren't you glad you came today, just so you could ask your neighbor, "What's your problem, man?" And uh, but I, there's a problem here in Genesis 16. And uh, it's a story of Abraham and Sarah. And of course, uh, there's an abbreviation of their names here. That's Abram and Sarah. That's not spelled the same as you see in other scriptures, but it's no different. Say, why did they do that? Well, it's no different than someone being named Nicholas and they call him Nick. It's no different than someone having a name of William and they call him Will or Bill. And uh, it's, it's no different than... Uh, you know, someone being called, uh, uh, you know, uh, Kathleen, and they, or they call her Katie, or, you know, uh, Deborah, and they call her Debbie, uh, which my sister doesn't like that, and she gives me the evil eye if I call her Debbie. And uh, so I don't, right, she gives me the evil eye, if I, so I call her, you know, Deborah. No. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we're so thankful and uh, for the word of God today. But here's the problem in this story. If you know the story a little bit, just give you a little background, I'll give that to you in just a moment, uh, detail in a moment, but couldn't have children. And uh, they made some choices that weren't wise. And although back in this day, there were things that people did and were allowable, but God told them to do something different. You ever, ever made a mistake in your life and you knew, you knew before you did it that it was going to be wrong, but you did it anyway? My hand's up. Man, we are so hard-headed, huh? Man, and, and that's the, really the message today. And listen, listen to me. There are things that we do that mess up our lives and, and, and things that we choose to do and decisions that we make that, that we do that bring upon, it, uh, upon this ourselves. And Abraham and Sarah did that. They, they brought these things and the consequences from that are still evident today, by the way. Choices they made. And I'm saying that, that, you know, every decision, you know what? You have every right to make any decision that you want to make. But the consequences of those decisions aren't up to you once you make it. And here they made some major decisions. They made one big decision. And, uh, man, we'll see some fallout from that, but there's some great application for us. And I'm going to share with you four things that believers do to mess up their lives. You know, in uh, a leadership book that I read, gave this and uh, said that Jay Leno, who uh, hosts The Tonight Show, I don't know if he still does, I don't watch it, but he, he did a segment called Man on the Street. And he did a type interview in which he asked some young people questions about the Bible. And he asked this one question. He says, can you name just one of the Ten Commandments? And he asked these college-age people, 
Now, I'm only going to give you one of them. One of them said freedom of speech. Man, that missed it. Jay Leno also asked other ones to complete the sentence. He says, when I say this, just complete the sentence. He says, let him who is without sin. And one response was, have a good time. Jay Leno turned to another person and asked, who according to the Bible was eaten by a well? By the big fish. And the confident answer of this young adult was Pinocchio. <laughs> I have to be around, on, honest with you. Those things get a chuckle and, and it's true. And I didn't do it to set you up. But I find it, I find it horrifying. And I think, is it any wonder that there's a morality problem in America today? Hey, is there any pro uh, a realization that in the church there's a morality problem? Pinocchio is not the answer. Yet I wonder how many of us could sit in a church building and not name the Ten Commandments. More seriously, if we, if we were asked the questions, uh, uh, I, I wonder how much we would even understand some of the significant Bible teaching that we've been given and how it applies to us. And this story will help us with that today. See, we've got to get in our Bible and grow, folks. And this is lacking in just most churches in America. And Christians are not only scattered they're leaving the church at an alarming rate. I heard a, a statistic the other day that says once a kid, a teenager, is over 13, and that if they have not been saved by the age 13, that there is a 90% chance that they'll never be saved. 90? And you wonder why we hammer children's ministries around here and while we are drastically changing the student ministry and our teen ministry and our young adult ministry and while we're desperate to grow and, and while we're adamant about giving the Bible to our young adults, I'll tell you why, because they're not coming back. Things they're doing are messing up their lives. Is it no wonder that 67% believe that religious influence is waning in America. 67% say, hey, church is out, God's over. I see a lot of Christians whose behavior is no different than the God that is represented in this book. They, they are, so I should say that we see a lot of Christians who behavior is very different, I should say, than the God who is represented in this book. I see them making the same poor choices over and over and over again and messing up their lives. And sometimes even to the point beyond repair, we're told that even the divorce rate is, is the same in the church as it is in the world. I mean, 41% of marriages, first marriages, end in divorce. It doesn't get better. 60% of all second marriages end in divorce. And 73% of third marriages end in divorce. You would think, now listen to me, if you were able to take a test and you failed the test the first time and this teacher said, hey, I'm going to give you two more shots to take the test. You'd think that with each passing time, you'd get a little bit better, right? Amen? How come we're getting worse? How come we're not passing the test? How come we're not making the great? As a church, I'll tell you why, because we're doing things that mess up our lives. Many believers' behaviors and morals on Monday through Saturday are really no different than those of their non-Christian friends. My question is, where's the church? 
Where are we? How do we blend in? How come we don't stand out? How come we can't find us during the week? From some recent statistics, 60% of American adults say that their faith is transformed and has transformed their life, while 29% only say it's only been somewhat helpful. That's it. Then, my friend, you have a dead faith. You got a dead religion. If it hasn't changed your life, if it hasn't impacted your life so to the point that you drastically go out in your world and change it, more than one out of every five Christians agreed that Jesus Christ sinned while on earth. One out of every five in this church agree that Jesus was a sinner my friend you are a heretic hello I'll have the boldness to say it any Christians that would say that Jesus Christ has sinned is a heretic and is lost and without God my friend that's not the God of this Bible that's not the Jesus I serve and if he's a man on the cross that was like any other sinner I have I am without hope, and I'm lost forever. My friend, you don't know the Bible. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin. And he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. Hey, get in the book and stop messing your life up. One out of every five? How can that be? How can this happen? I'll tell you why. We're not in the Bible. 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 I'm going to do it until I get 100%. We're not in the Bible. I know. Lord have mercy. I'm going to say it so he'll shut up. I tell you what, you didn't have no problem shouting when Magna Vista scored a touchdown. You didn't have no problem shouting when the Martinsville Bulldogs scored a touchdown. But you come in here and you shut your mouth because you're afraid that somebody across the road from you will hear you say amen. Hey, they know you're not living it anyway. You might as well fess it up and get it right with God and start living right so you can stop messing it up. You know what the church is? This place is a place for broken down people. We need to quit putting up all the facade that we got it all together. Listen, you know why we come here? Because we ain't got it together and I need some help. Man, I'm a messed up person. And until I fess it up, God won't clean it up. It would do some of us some good this morning. Those who are watching me by internet, you're listening to this by audio. Let me tell you something. You can get right on your knees where you are, right in front of the TV, right in front of that computer, and you can repent to a holy and righteous God who will forgive you of all your sins. Man, you can clean it up if you'll fess it up, and God will do the changing if you'll just get right with God. You don't have to worry about who's around. You can have a changed life. I've always wanted to preach at the TV, and I just did it. Sixty-five percent of evangelical teens never read their Bible. Sixty-five percent of our young adults fake it on Wednesday night and Sunday you act like you have a devotion you act like that and you'll do it just to fake it you'll fake it till you make it but let me tell you something God didn't fold by all that junk and I'm going to tell you something you may sow that stuff right now but eventually the harvest will come up we'll know in a few years if you've been faking it hey let me tell you something to our young adults look all up here you think I don't hear about somehow some of you are acting in school? People you hanging around? Want to know why? Because you're not in your Bible. 
Some of you teenagers need to help the other young adults and call it out. You need to call a spade a spade. And you need to call them out and say, hey, listen, but I can tell you're not in your Bible. You don't do it hateful and you don't do it spiteful. But I'm going to tell you, nothing will make you stronger as a youth group and as a student ministry until you start making each other accountable. Church, before you get all on the bandwagon saying amen and hallelujah, guess what? Nothing will make this church stronger. Nothing will make us better at reaching the lost until we start being honest before one another and start helping one another be more accountable. Say, hey, listen, you about to mess up. I see it, man. It's like writing on the wall. Cut it out and get in the Bible. But you know what? We have gotten so gracious oriented and so mercy filled that we have forgotten that God still rebukes and chastises the sinner. Say, well, you ain't God. I sure ain't. But we are his hands and feet and we can help each other. And we should never do it hard or bitter or angry or in, in the wrong spirit. But you're not going to get this type of support or this help in the world. They'll let you mess up your life and let you get away with it. We're going to go to the Word of God now in Genesis chapter 16, and we've got to learn from it. We've got to, we, we, we got to, uh, we got to take uh, heart from what it says, and, and uh, I, I want you to allow me to teach you this morning, and I want you to open your heart. And I'm going to work hard on my part to communicate it to you clearly but you're going to have to open your heart and your spirit to receive it today. I'm going to tell you, a seed is sown each and every week, and man, it falls on hard ground. It falls on fallow ground. And Hosea 10 reminds us to break up our fallow ground. Listen, don't come in here blaming the preacher because your life isn't changed. It isn't my fault. It isn't even my problem. No more is it your problem if I don't live right. You know whose problem it is? It's my problem. And it's your problem. That's the title of the series, What's Your Problem? So let's be receptive this morning. And I'm going to ask you a question. You know what this is on the, on the screen? What is this? Does anybody know? Easy with you, believer. That's what that sounded like. It sounded like a bunch of bees. <laughs> Did you hear that? That's what it's. Man, that was as clear as it could be. All right. It's a dashboard. What is on the dashboard? I, maybe I asked it wrong. What is on this dashboard? Instruments. Someone said lights. RPMs. <laughs> yeah. What? Speedometer. Gas gauge. All right. <laughs> Look. Yes. JC, did you say that? No, who said that? Angus. Angus. I love Angus. He's so fun. You know, he really pointed out what's really important about this. On this is called indicator lights. Some of you have been riding around and living your life with indicator lights on for a very long time. And you may say, well, it really looks pretty because they're different colors. And it really illuminates my dashboard really nice. But I'm going to tell you, if you keep ignoring the problem, you're going to end up broken down. And you can ignore the problem for a little while, but you're going to pay for it later. Man, if I'd have took care of the brakes when they first started squeaking, I'll tell you what, I'll take that little bracket on there that uh, is the indicator that they're going back. I'll just bend that a little bit. I've done that. Man, them things are annoying. Let's just move that little thing and I won't have to hear them squeak. Man, that belt's pretty shot. I'll tell you what, I'll put some belt conditioner on it. Even though I can see through the belt, I'll just put some conditioner on it. That'll make it run better. You know what we do? I'll just come to church. That'll do it. That'll get the preacher off my back. That'll make me feel better about my conscience. That'll get 
my spouse from just eating me alive. Why don't you come to church? Why don't you come to church? I'll come to church so you'll stop it. And we've ignored the real problem. The problem's not with the light. The light is there to show you that there is a greater problem that exists. And I'm telling you right now that in God's word this morning, there's some great indicator lights. There's four indicator lights, four things I want to show you that we do to mess up our life. And I'm saying, don't unplug it. Don't take out the fuse. Don't ignore it. Let's fix the problem. Let's not ignore what God is trying to tell us this morning. All right, can you do that? Say, I'm with you, Pastor. Look at your neighbor and say, don't ignore it. Look at your neighbor and say, don't put it off. Another title for the message could be four stupid things that believers do to mess up their lives. Now listen, I'm going to say some things in the message and I don't want you to understand what I'm saying. There's some various problems in the human race and that are both grievous and both nature and effects. And, and may nothing I say here uh, this morning uh, uh, take away from the truth and from the emotional pain that some of you may be in. Childlessness is a problem and is very painful. And, and an unhappy marriage is a loss of a loved one, disappointment in children when you've raised them and then they rebel. Or many similar issues that tax us. Uh, 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 just uh, uh, seemingly to the limits of our emotional stability. Please do not misunderstand what I say today. And Sarah's inability to conceive children was a very real pain that she had lived with for a very long time. And when we enter in this story, she's 75 years old. And let me tell you something from my heart this morning. Uh, my wife and I know what it's like not to have children for 11 years and desperately want children in our life. And it took us 11 years. And granted, uh, we're we're not 75 years old, but for you that are older in the Lord, there's still hope for you. Amen. Yeah, you didn't like that one. Yeah, you're not real sure. 75. Huh? Yeah, fill those nurseries. Come on. Now listen, having said that, I want you to know that some of us, man, make up schemes and we cook up some desperate remedies for these problems. And to be honest with you, we make them worse. You're about to see that illustrated here in the Word of God. I want you to look at chapter 16. Would you look at verse 1? Now Sarah, Abraham's, I'm just going to use their whole name for the sake of the story. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. And she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Everybody say Hagar. Hagar. Now look at verse 2. And Sarah said unto Abraham, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto thy maid, Hagar. Everybody say Hagar. It may be uh, that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah. Sarah proposes to uh, his second wife, in this case, a younger slave woman, and uh, have a child through her. And that may sound strange to us today, and it is today, but in their day it was very accepted in that culture. And, and uh, for a woman to uh, be barren and to have children, uh, she used her as a surrogate. And of course they had no technology that we have today, and uh, this act may seem very impersonal uh, uh, today, but let me tell you, uh, this woman had actually... Uh, have become Abraham's wife. And look at verse 3. <coughs> and Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid the Egyptian, after Abraham, had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, <coughs> and, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. He married her. The things that Abraham and Sarah were plotting here would... Not raise a single eyebrow in the day, in this day. Yet, Abraham and Sarah were abandoning, they were totally disregarding what God had told them to do. Look at verse 15. Let me, 
I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 15. I, I told you, verse 15. I want you to go to chapter 15. I told you wrong. And look at verse 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying unto thee, Thy seed I have, uh, have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the, uh, river of Euphrates. And then he goes ahead and names those. And, and he tells them in chapter 15, uh, he tells him, You're going to have a son. And he says, From your seed is going to be all these nations coming. He clearly lays out in the chapter before, Abraham, I am going to give you a son. I'm going to give you a seed. And from that seed is going to come some great nations. Clear in chapter 15. Yet in chapter 16, Sarah goes to Abraham and says, Hey, I can't have any children. Hey, uh, won't you take Hagar and uh, see if she can conceive a child for us or for me. See, they were resorting to the flesh rather than living by faith. And Paul had made it clear they were not to do this. Say, preacher, what is the first thing that we do to mess up our lives? Here it is, and it's on the screen. They let fleshly desires overrule making godly decisions. Let that sink in for a moment. One of the things that we do to mess up our lives is when we let fleshly desires overrule making godly decisions. Sex before marriage. Wrong. Sin. But I love him. No, you don't. You mean you lust him. Right? Preacher, don't say that word. It's in the Bible. God calls it fornication. We do things that appease our flesh rather than making godly choices. Sarah wanted a child so bad, and so did Abraham. Very understandable. However, God gave them a promise. And instead of fulfilling the promise and believing what God says, they said, you know what? We're going to do it our way. And when you get ahead of God and when you disregard what God says, guess what? You're about to mess up. This is a big mess up right here. Galatians 4, verse 22 through 23 says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after flesh, but he of the free woman was made or was by a promise. I've given you a promise, Abraham. Uh uh-uh. uh, we're gonna do it our way. Problem. And anytime we're given a promise of God and we result to our own means, we're doing exactly what they did. We're letting fleshly desires overrule making godly choices. When people think they're desperate, it's amazing what they're willing to do. A wife who has been faithful to God and to her husband for years. Frantic for his decision that is lacking and because he is not loving her as God says he should love her. And aware of maybe her aging body or even fading physical attraction. She goes out and and for the first guy who gives her attention or tells her how nice she looks or how uh, nice she may uh, smell. She throws herself uh, without discretion to the wind and then ends up committing adultery. It happens just like that. Or vice versa. You know what? That's a fleshly desire overruling making godly decisions. Can I get an amen? Are you with me? Not so sure. A Christian man who's tired of his unsuccessful uh, 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 search for a believing mate finally gives in and marries either a non-Christian or a woman with a dubious faith, which really isn't a faith at all. A Christian teenager who is exasperated by the apparent inconsistencies in their parents rebels and starts taking drugs or, or doing other things that are ungodly. Let me tell you something. That's a fleshly desire that's overruling making godly decisions. 
The world around us considers these things acceptable as way of coping. After all, you've been through so much. After all, you deserve to be happy. After all, it seems to be right. After all, you've had a tough life. You ought to do something for yourself. It always seems that there seems to be a ready cheering section of friends who are just ready and willing to help you live ungodly. They say, well, that's right, just do it. You have it coming. You deserve to be happy. And it sounds so true and it sounds so convincing. And when you feel desperate, sometimes you act upon it. But these people aren't representing God's word. They're representing fleshly desires. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 8, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that he also shall reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Sow to the flesh, reap corruption. Corruption. Sow to the Spirit of God, you'll reap a life everlasting. In our desperation, sometimes we say to ourselves, Surely God will understand my frustration and not hold me accountable. Or perhaps there may be some who say, I don't care what God thinks. I'm going to do it anyway. Or some may say, and I've heard this, I don't care if I go to hell. Some say it's hell to live in this condition anyway. My friend, may I remind you today that hell is not a party. That hell is not a vacation. That hell is a place where there will be eternal torment without any end. You will wish you could die, and you can't. You'll be wishing the rocks can fall on you, and they won't. You'll be wishing as though your body is burning, yet it doesn't burn up. You ever had a grease fire or something get on you, maybe popping from uh, out of the pan onto you, and, you, and it pops on you, and it burns real quick, and you do like this, and you try to get it off, or you run it under the water? That's exactly what hell will be like, but it will not stop. It'll be constant, burning, constant, 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 constant. Over and over and over and over. Hell is not a place that you want to go. But we negate those kind of things and we're like, you know what? We're going to choose to do what we want to. And uh, I just want to remind you, Abraham and Sarah, so faithfully in their lives to this point, are now scheming according to their flesh and not according to their faith. And this will end up in disaster, by the way, all because they are letting fleshly desires overrule making godly choices. May I give you number two very quickly. How do you mess up your life? Number two is when you listen to and take advice from those who are unfamiliar with the Word of God. When you listen to and take advice from those who are unfamiliar with the Word of God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You won't hear another practical message like this or more practical message than this. I'm gonna, this is a problem. Man, we listen to everybody who has anything to say, and yet it's not godly counsel. I know it's quiet in here, but I don't care. You need this, and I need this. Man, we surround ourselves around what we call good friends, and yet they never offer us any spiritual counsel. I want to remind you this morning that those who don't love the Lord won't help you serve the Lord. Look at verse 2 through 4 in chapter 16. Genesis 16. Sarah tells Abraham in verse 2, Hey, won't you take uh, our handmaid? Abraham listens. In verse 3, he takes her and marries her. Verse 4. And he went into or in unto Hagar. In other words, he became intimate with her. And she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Well, who's that? Sarah. All right, they've done it. The deed is done now. 
And at least the child they had always wanted for so long was on the way. I mean, the house would soon be filled with the sound of Liddy, little happy feet and, and a child playing. And uh, what joy it would bring them and uh, what possibly could go wrong. I mean, after all, didn't they deserve to be happy? I want you to know the euphoria was short-lived, though. The trouble started even before the child was born. The tension that resulted in the house from day to day and onward so thick you could cut it with a life, what was intended to reproduce happiness would only end up producing nearly endless sorrow in areas that they had never expected. My point is, there are stupid things that we do to mess up our lives. One is letting fleshly desires overrule godly choices. But it's when we listen to and take advice from those who are unfamiliar with the Word of God. Would you look at verse 2, the very end of it? Should be after a period in your Bible. It says, and Abraham and Abram hearkened to the voice of who? Now look up here. Before someone thinks I'm a male chauvinist pig, listen to me. Some of you, it'd be good for you to listen to your wives. The Bible says dwell with them according to knowledge. Okay? But God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Sarah said, take our handmaiden. Take Hagar. Who did Abraham obey? Did he obey God or Sarah? Which one was right? Which one was wrong? Say, are you saying she wasn't a godly woman? No, I'm saying she made an ungodly choice. What I'm saying is, listen, he listened to and took advice from someone who was unfamiliar with the word of God. God spoke directly to Abraham and said, wait on me. I'll do the providing around here. I've got it all covered. And he didn't. He didn't listen. God had appeared to Abraham, not Sarah, when they had left the, uh, Ur. And, and, and he appeared to Abraham again, and, and not Sarah, and when they had left Haran. And in fact, on one occasion, God appeared, including uh, uh, even in chapter 15. And uh, for the second time, we won't look at that. But he also made a land covenant and a promise uh, from that child of Abram's own body. The revelation of this was made solely to Abraham. Abraham knew something that Sarah did not. Can I tell you something? Spiritual people need spiritual advice. When we seek help in making decisions, we need to seek out mature believers who know God's word firsthand. Yet today it's far more common, especially when we're desperate we contemplate stepping outside of God's will in order to seek advice from weak believers or those who don't know God's word at all. It's almost a proverb that the people in this condition seek advice from those who would tell them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. The surest way to make an enemy is if you love the things of God is to step in and tell a person what the Bible says. You ever found that out to be true? You know, God's word says, uh, don't tell me what it says. I know. Well, if you know so much, then why don't you obey it? Then you don't need me to tell you, right? Because you got it all together. Then so you're going to do what's godly, right? Well, I didn't say that. Paul was aware of this and even talked about it in Galatians chapter 4. He says to the Galatians, he says, man, how can you be enticed? How can you go back to the beggarly elements? How could you be so uh, bewitched? Who, who bewitched you, oh foolish Galatians? How could this happen to you? And from the non-Christian counselor to the non-Christian best friend, the advice that is usually sought by such a one contemplating, stepping out in God's will, uh, doesn't come from Scripture, but it comes from the popular culture. Yet the Bible says in Psalm 1, Psalm 1, 1, Blessed is the man 
that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Do you notice the digression here? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, walking, nor standeth in the way of sinners, and then now sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Boy, it reminds me of the life of Lot. And that's how quick it comes in our life. Man, it's not too bad. Man, we're doing okay. Doesn't seem to be a big problem. All of a sudden, now we're listening to it. And before all you know it, now we're sitting down. Man, we're just eating that ungodly advice up. That'll mess your life up. You know, Abraham didn't tell Sarah what God had told him. How can I mess up my life? How do you mess up your life? First, by letting fleshly desires overrule making godly decisions. Second, by listening and taking advice from those who are unfamiliar with the Word of God. But then number three, very quickly, how about this? They blame others for what they brought upon themselves. Now, I don't know where you are today. I don't know if, if you're letting fleshly desires overrule you or if maybe you're listening to and taking advice from those who are unfamiliar with the Word of God. But listen to me. Listen to me. Don't tune out. This right here may be one of your biggest problems. Instead of taking personal responsibility, you blame everyone else. You've blamed the church for years now. You've blamed every preacher, every deacon, every member, every parent you've had, every grandparent. You blame your children. You blame the work. You blame your boss. You blame the media. You blame the president. You're going to even blame the new president who we don't even have yet. I said new. I'm not going to tell you who I'm voting for. (laughs) Surely when the trouble started for Abraham and Sarah, they recognized their fault and owned up to it. No. Would you look at verse 4? Said at the end of verse 4, her mistress was despised in her eyes. (laughs) Look at verse 5. And Sarah said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. It's your fault. You did this to me. The Bible says in verse 4, when it uses the word despised, it's the original language that carries the connotation of taking something lightly, or trifling it, it, it sometimes means to belittle. Suddenly, in Hagar's eyes, her mistress Sarah is no longer respected with the same weight of honor as before. And why should that be resp- uh, surprising? Hagar is now elevated to a higher position than Sarah. After all, she's the one who conceived. Now she blames Abraham. She, uh, Hagar's younger and she conceives children. And perhaps she believes that she has supplanted a, 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 a Sarah uh, in Abraham's heart. And from Sarah's vantage point, uh, this isn't the way it was supposed to work out. And of course, we result to trusting schemes in our flesh rather than trusting God and His promises. And it never turns out like we expected. So Sarah was humbled by her attempt to make things happen. And she went and apologized for her ill-fated decision, right? Not according to verse 5, she didn't. You know what she did? She blamed Abraham. She points the finger. That's what she does. She points the finger. In verse 5, she says, my wrong be upon what? Thee. It's kind of like this picture. It's your problem. You did this to me. This is your fault. Adam did the same thing. 
in the Garden of Eden, didn't he? Adam, where are you? What happened? Uh, we're hiding. Why are you hiding? Because we're naked. Who told you we were naked? How'd you sin? Well, we ate some fruit. Well, who gave it to you? Well, that woman that you gave me, that chick, you know. You know, you took something from me, made this girl, you know. So she gave me this apple. I mean, she was fine, so she, you know, she tricked me. No, no, you, you, you believed it. And, and, and Adam shifted blame. Sarah here is blaming Abraham. And if it's as Sarah was saying, I didn't say it was your fault. I just said, I'm going to blame you. And maybe you think that way, and maybe you consider that, and maybe you say that. Hey, it's, it's, well, it's, I, I'm not saying it, it, it's their fault. I, I, I'm just not going to take personal responsibility. I'm going to blame you. And a sure sign of spiritual immaturity is when we blame others and when we find ourselves, uh, uh, instead of uh, blaming and putting the blame where it belongs, uh, Jesus has something to say about this too. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse 5, he says, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. He says, And then thou shalt clearly uh, be able to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. You know what? It's easy to judge and place responsibility on someone else instead of looking at it as Jesus says. And Jesus says, Clean it up yourself. Clean, won't you worry about cleaning you up? Won't you take responsibility for what you've done? So what does it mean when people refuse to take responsibility? What, it, what does it mean when they are destined uh, 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 to, to not take the blame and respond, or take the responsibility? I'll tell you what it means. It means they're destined to repeat it over and over again. They stagger their way through life from one crisis to the next, battered, bruised, and taken advantage of. And it never occurs to them that they hold the key to changing things, but they're too proud to admit that they're wrong. And I've already told you, Adam did the same thing in Genesis 3.12. What did he say? And the man said, oh, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Not my fault. It's not my fault. It's the economy's fault. It's not my fault. It's the bank's fault. It's not my fault. It's the job's fault. It's not my fault. It's the boss. It's not my fault. My kids, I can't get them to do anything right. It's not my fault. It's the car. It's not my fault. You preach too long. Let, let, let me give you the fourth thing. Listen, stop letting fleshly desires overrule making godly decisions. Listen, stop listening and taking advice from those who are unfamiliar with God's Word. Listen, stop blaming others and start taking responsibility upon yourself. And then fourthly, listen, here, here's how we mess up. We refuse to stand for the truth in order to remain popular, liked, or accepted by others. Look, here's how we mess up. We refuse to stand for the truth in order to remain popular, liked, or accept it. Doesn't it seem to you that it was about time for Abraham to take charge of the situation? I mean, he could have said, hey, listen, folks, the whole thing started because I let it happen. Uh, I didn't have to consent to this fleshly thing. And, and, and Sarah, uh, uh, listen, we're not going to do it. We're, we're not going to do this. We're going to obey God. And, and I, 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 I just, I need you to know that uh, God said, uh, but now that we've done this, listen, will you choose to forgive me for my foolishness? Man, I, I was wrong. Now with what I've done, listen, Sarah, I need you to realize uh, that this was your suggestion at the beginning. And you brought it upon yourself. And it's high time that you start taking responsibility for it. And then go to Hagar. Hey, listen, you're going to need to get off your high horse. Remember that uh, uh, you're still a servant in our house. And that you need to treat Sarah, my wife, with respect. But he didn't do that. Abraham didn't assume any uh, responsibility here and he didn't assume it fairly and uh, he became a pushover rather than a patriarch and verse 6 look at this but Abraham said unto Sarah behold thy maid is in thy hand uh, do to her as it pleases thee and when Sarah dealt hardly with her uh, she fled from her face 
You know one reason we may not stand for truth? Is as one writer said, sometimes we fear men so much because we fear God so little. What will others think? I mean, if I go to church twice in one day, Lord have mercy. They'll be texting me, calling me, asking me, I'm okay, is anything wrong? Well, you sure to go to church a lot this week. Is everything okay? Do you need to talk? Not to you, I don't. Just to Jesus. I mean, after all, Abraham didn't want to rock the boat. He got the deer in the headlights look, if you will. and He said, do whatever you think is right, dear. And uh, I'm just reminded what Paul said in Ephesians 6, 11. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. He says, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. It's the word of God that helps you to stand for truth. That's what you need to stand for. Stop standing on your own emotions and your own thoughts and your own life and your own ways. And listen, stop messing up and start standing for the truth of God. Men, I'm not suggesting that you become a tyrant in any situation uh, you don't need to lead by dictatorship in your home. But I'm going to tell you something, God, uh, man, listen, uh, God needs some godly men. There, there, there's homes that need God, godly husbands and godly uh, 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 dads. Uh, uh, God wants us to be men with integrity, men with character, whose children will look up to us and go, man, that's who I want to aspire to be. I want to be just like my dad. Or her daughter who, who will look up to her dad and say, Hey, I want to I wanna marry a husband uh, someday just like my dad. Because I've seen how my dad treats my mom. And man, it's awesome. And uh, man, if he ain't like my dad, I'm not, I won't marry anybody unless it's just like my dad. Where's those men at? God wants us to be men who, as Paul said in Philippians 1, 27, only let your conversation be as it become of the gospel of Christ, that whether I come or be absent, uh, that I may see you, I may hear of your affairs, and that you stand fast in one spirit, uh, with one mind, striving together uh, for the faith of the gospel. Uh, let me tell you something, man. Uh, you need to stand up in your home, and you need to lead godly, and you need to help your family strive together for the faith of the gospel. Uh, don't let your wife do it. Don't let your children do it. You be the first up on Sunday morning. You be the first out the door on Wednesday night say hey as for me and my house we'll serve the Lord that's what you need to do I know it ain't real popular and I know we want an easy message and I know we want something that tickles the ears and I know we want something that's more palatable uh, palatable to our our taste buds but let me tell you something uh, these four things will mess your life up you let fleshly desires overrule making God decisions guess what you're, you're gonna mess up you, 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 you allow yourself to listen to and take advice from those who are unfamiliar with God's word. Guess what? You're going to mess up. You're, you're right there. That's what, that's what you're going to do. And I'm just reminded tonight or today that we have to we gotta learn from this story. And it doesn't seem to get really any better at this point. In this chapter or in even further verses and chapters. And, and the truth is today, do you, do you, do you remember that, that picture I had where it showed the, the, the dashboard of the car and the indicator lights? Well, God's wanting to indicate something to you today. And on the screen, I, I, I'm going to go ahead. Look, look, look at this on the screen. What is this? Can anybody tell me what this is? No, it's not more. It is. You do Morse code by it. It's a Morse code telegraph. Right? You, you know what? Remind of a story that in early day, a certain man was seeking a job as a Morse code telegraph operator. And he found an advertisement in the wall ads and went to the address that was listed. And when he arrived there, there was a large, busy, noisy office. Man, there were a lot of people there. But in the background, he could hear the chatter of the telegraph key. And 
And a sign instructed all the applicants to take a seat and wait until they were summoned to enter the office for an interview. The candidates had been there, and they, they, uh, he was one of the last ones to get there, and they're all seated along the wall and in the, in the room, and they were kind of discouraged because it was taking so long, uh, but still he sat down and he waited for his turn. And about two or three minutes later, uh, this young man, who was the last one to come in, stood up, stepped out, and went right into the office. Everyone's just looking around like, who does this guy think he is? Naturally, all the other, uh, other applicants started looking at each other and muttering. And, and, uh, but within just a few minutes, the young man came back out uh, uh, with the uh, uh, boss or, or with the um, employer. And, uh, and he opened the door and he says, gentlemen, you may all go now. And all of them stood up and a few of them started murmuring and complaining. He says, the position has been filled. And they said, well, well how could this happen? Uh, how did this guy get the job? He was the last one here. He said, I don't understand. We never even got the chance to be interviewed by you. You never even asked us to come in and, and to ask us if we wanted the job. And they all said, well, that's not fair. And then the employer said, the whole time that you've been sitting here, the telegraph key has been ticking out a message. And it simply said, if you understand this message, please come right in because the job is yours. And the employer looked at all of them. He said, none of you heard it, but he did. And so he got the job. Some of you come week after week. God has been sending out the message to you through God's word. And you won't get it. You won't listen. And you will continue to mess up your life from these four things. You let fleshly desires overrule making good, godly choices. You listen and take Advice from those who are unfamiliar with God's word. And you blame others for things that you bring upon yourself. And you refuse to stand for truth. In order to remain popular, liked, or accepted by others. And, and, and I've got to tell you something. This is the last statement. God isn't speaking Morse code to us today. He has given us his word to follow and help us grow. All we need to do is get in it and listen. God's not speaking Chinese. He's not speaking some code you don't understand. He's giving us His living word so you'll get in it and grow and change. Want to keep messing up your life? Then you keep doing those four things or any of those four and you will. You know, my prayer today is for you is that you'll simply listen to God's word and that you'll take God's word to heart and that you'll respond accordingly. I'm going to ask that you stand right now. And here it is. Here's simple. No, no, we're not going to play. We're not going to do anything. I just want you to stand with me right now. And look up here. You can put your Bible down. Here it is. How, how, how are you going to respond to this? How, how will you. And what will you do to make a decision today? Some of you. In a crowd this size, there's no doubt that some of you are not saved. You've been putting it off. God's been dealing with your heart. You've been coming to service. You've heard the word of God. You've heard the gospel preached. And you have refused to accept Christ as your Savior. You have refused to repent of your sins and turn to Christ in complete faith.